Thanks everyone for being here. Real quick at the top of uh, this presentation, I wanna call your attention to the brand new DBT community survey, which you can find in announcements. Uh, I hope you take a moment to check it out, give us your honest feedback and help us improve. My name is Drew Bannon. I'm one of the co-founders at Fishtown Analytics. And usually I operate as our chief product officer, but today I will be your art curator. Today, I wanna to talk to you about art. Now we use art as a lens to reflect upon our past, observe our current moment in data, and cast our minds towards the future. And our story will begin with prehistoric art. Prehistoric art commemorated epic triumphs. These were incredible feats in which very many people expended great effort with low autonomy, and together, entire communities could do great things. Here's one such example of hieroglyphics and stone carving reliefs from ancient Egypt. This particular picture demonstrates a number of different people who each play their specific role in a process and together can create monuments that stand the test of time. Prehistory and data, well, this is the all-in-one solution. These solutions do a little bit of everything, but none of it particularly well. It's poorly integrated, it's rigid and inflexible. And as a result, it represents a high total cost of ownership with vendor lock-in and high switching costs. These siloed data products lead to siloed data and siloed teams. This painting is called Building an Executive Dashboard 2020. Here we see a number of different people, each solving a very specific problem. As they pass these problems over the fence to their colleagues to solve other specific problems, they collectively, as an entire society, can deliver an executive dashboard six weeks late that is never viewed again. The dashboard is a monument that stands the test of time. You can't get rid of it, even if you want to. The thing we're missing here is flexibility. We crave autonomy and leverage. That takes us to the Renaissance. Let's fast forward a couple thousand years. Renaissance, it's French word, it means rebirth. This painting is a fresco called The School of Athens by Raphael. It's one of my favorites. I actually posted this in, in the Slack thread. I'm excited to see what your favorite art is too. One of the things I like most about this piece of art is right at the center, there are two figures. It's Plato and Aristotle. Plato is pointing towards the heavens, referencing his idealized platonic forms. Aristotle points to the earth, to the ground, referencing empiricism and the scientific method. It's this duality and this balance that I find so interesting in Renaissance art. And I'm going to resize my screen so that it's not a portrait window. We're doing it live. A lot of art is about improvisation and resizing windows. And we'll continue on. Renaissance and art is all about the focal point it introduces the linear perspective. Our eyes are going to be drawn towards a central focal point of each image. And while we'll see that there is context in these images, it's not central. This painting is called Christ Handing the Keys to St. Peter. It's from the 15th century. Here we can see these parallel lines that draw our eyes towards the central focal point of the image, this monument in the background. And we can see there's much happening around the edges, but it's not integrated. These things are happening on different planes. The Renaissance and data, this is the cloud data warehouse. These data warehouses do one thing and they do it very well. They create the opportunity for more integration. This context exists, but at the time of the Renaissance, it was at the edges. This painting is called storing the super user creds in one password. The central focal point of the Renaissance and data is the data warehouse. We can see that there are buttressed buildings of data loaders and BI tools and the greater context of data modeling, data quality, operations and governance. But at the inception of the data warehouse and our, and our data stacks, these things weren't fully realized yet. My story with the Renaissance of Data is back in 2014, I was working at an internet radio startup called 8 Tracks. We had a Redshift cluster and we didn't have off the shelf data loaders or BI tools that we could use. So we had to build them ourselves. We knew that these were important, but the space sort of hadn't realized good tooling for us to, to you know, pay for it. We had to, we had to build it at that point. 
kind of as a result of this context existing at the edges, we thought a little bit about data modeling and we certainly had challenges with data quality, but we weren't really in a place to bring things like operations and governance into the front and center, into the fold of the work that we were doing. Really, we were just focused on the warehouse itself. And so that brings us to modern day. This is a piece by Pied Mondragon called Tableau One. Salesforce recently bought this painting at auction for $15.7 billion. They heard Tableau and they spot it. Um, just kidding. Modernism is all about deconstructing our perspective. It's about creating art that embodies our perception, if not our reality. And it asks us to question the difference between the two. In art, Modernism is about decomposition. We decompose the complex. We re rearrange it as we see it. And it leads to many new definitions of what it means for something to be whole. One such example is Guernica by Picasso from 1937. In modernist art, we throw away our clean lines and realistic perspective. There's no parallel lines here or, or clear perspectives. Uh, it's because those geometric shapes don't represent our realities. This art rejects idealism and geometric precision and instead reflects the fragmentation and chaos of what it means to exist. In data, well, we have the modern data stack. There are many specialized components, each focused on integration. There's greater individual autonomy, both for the components of the data stack and the individuals working within it. But we see that the lines become blurry. It's hard to tell where one part ends and the next begins. This is the modern data stack. We see that the data warehouse is still central, but it's no longer isolated. Everything exists on the same plane. We've thrown away our clean lines and geometric forms, instead focused on building data stacks that reflect the needs of our businesses. They're a little bit messy because businesses are made of humans and humans are a little bit messy. This arrangement is harder to get right than the prehistoric all-in-one solution. It requires more people to work more autonomously with more leverage the outcome, if you can get it right, is that work is done better, faster, and more, with more stability than ever before. So that's where we are today. The modern data stack is built as a reflection of our realities. It forces us to rethink the clean lines that we've drawn in our organizations, inspires us to think more about our shared realities. This painting is a self-portrait by Vincent van Gogh. And so I want to use this opportunity to look ourselves in the mirror and reflect honestly on where we are. The truth is that while the modern data stack has solved a huge number of challenges for us, it's also introduced new ones. One of the biggest new challenges of the modern data stack is the knowledge and skills gap. For the data builders, it involves a mastery of SQL and data systems and uh, new skills that are, that are critically important. For data consumers, treating data as a product requires new skills and new relationships within our organizations. Data builders are no longer building dashboards as a service, then we need to rethink our relationships and work to empower these data consumers to self-serve. How did it start? Well, organizations were thinking about training for a task, not a career. These task-focused roles encourage service provider relationships between different parts of the business. How's it going? Well, we're focusing on building transferable skills and creating a more resilient workforce. If you're an expert analytics engineer, I think you can do a pretty good job of operational analytics because you have those core skills, regardless of the domain and problem space that you're working in. Beyond that, analytics flexibility, velocity, and reliability are at an all-time high. We hear time and time again that with DBT and the modern data stack, folks can do better work faster and more reliably uh, than they ever could before. Usually you have to pick two of those three things and getting all three is, is special. One of the things I think is most inspiring here is that this very conference is us working to fill in these knowledge and skill gaps. I like this quote that says, all of us are smarter than any of us. And it's great to see that we're making a priority to learn from each other. Over the next five years, these knowledge gaps will, I think, stop being such a big problem we'll have better resources and more educational materials. But I think it will be an open question if we're going to be able to rewire our relationships around data within our organizations in the time frame. The second challenge is the fast changing landscape of the modern data stack. It's, a, it's very exciting, the number of new tools that spring up every day and, and changes happening in the space. But at the same time, do we want business intelligence to be exciting? 
This is a high flexibility, low commitment environment for both vendors and customers. How did it start? Well, batteries weren't included. It actually took a lot of work to connect these tools together. I think we've gotten better here, but it certainly isn't a seamless at, at all layers of the stack. And over the past few years, there's been quite a lot of innovation and quite a lot of consolidation too. I bet that over the past couple of years, one of the data tools in your stack probably got acquired. I think that for some folks, one of the data tools in their stack might have been acquired in the past 24 hours. And that's sort of the environment that we're living in when things are changing so quickly. How's it going? Well, vendors are assuming responsibility for building more connection points. There's actually less work to do for analytics engineers to plug things together if the vendors take on that responsibility instead. We're collectively realizing that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And I'm beginning to see conversations about open standards for things like data lineage and provenance take place. I think these are really exciting. Ultimately, most vendors are playing in the same sandbox. They're thinking less about walled gardens and more about green fields. And I think it's a good thing for everyone. Third challenge is uh, a phrase that I really like, opaque and isolated dependencies. This phrase comes courtesy of David Wallace, a friend of ours at Fishtown Analytics. And if you want to hear more about this, I totally encourage you to join our When Metadata Becomes Data panel later this afternoon. What do we mean by opaque and isolated dependencies? Well, the big question is, would you rather have one big single point of failure or dozens of tiny ones? How did we get here? Well, we have somewhat inscrutable data architectures and big components of our architectures might be labeled Python scripts. There are many points of failures with complex dependencies between them. And if something goes wrong, you need complete knowledge and access to the entire system to understand what the problem was, what the impacts of that problem are. How's it going? We're working on it. It's one of the things I want to talk to you about in the second half of this presentation. Ultimately, we don't have great tools to understand when things are going wrong or how to fix them. That's true for us as builders. Think about our data consumers. How do they know what's happening inside the warehouse? Errors in one part of the stack can have subtle but meaningful impacts on other parts of the stack. And without that complete system level knowledge, it's impossible to know what is happening and if data is in good shape or not. And so what's ahead? This is an MC Escher piece. What I want to do is paint for you a vision of the future. Given the information I have today, this is my best guess of what the postmodern data stack, the data stack of the future, will look like. The way I want to do this is by drawing a pyramid. So some of this is going to look a little bit familiar. This is sort of a, a hierarchy of, we'll say needs for now, but it's a little more than that. In the physical layer of the pyramid, data is loaded into a central data store in a timely manner. I bet we all have tools that do something like this. And I feel like this is a well-addressed part of the data stack today. In the logical layer, this raw data is converted into information through data modeling. So this is the place where you might use DBT. In the quality layer, information is verified as correct and safe to use for analytics. Uh, DBT helps with this. And if you want to hear more about it, you should also check out the Great Expectations stock happening later. Uh, today or tomorrow, I actually forgot, sorry. And then probably the last piece of most of your stacks is operations and reporting. This is where information makes its way into systems and eyeballs. So the astute among you will note that this isn't a typical looking pyramid. What I want to argue is that we are missing three crucial layers of the stack that we will see come into fruition over the next five years. The first one is awareness. In the awareness layer, data sets are cataloged documented and disseminated within organizations. Second layer is observability. This is where the state of the system can be observed wholly from its outputs. We'll talk a lot more about this in a moment. Finally, communication. This is where data builders and consumers discuss data in context. And so this is my picture of the data stack of tomorrow. So let's get into it. I think the data stack of tomorrow will support data cataloging and data discovery as first class needs. It will provide tooling to unite the disparate components of the data stack and create observability into what is ultimately a very complex system. Finally, it will create the opportunity for data to be discussed in context. 
awareness. Today, that looks like Slack and email. Tomorrow, I think that will look like data catalogs, data discovery tools, things that help with governance and compliance all in one place. What are we missing? Well, there's a lot of tools out there that, that address data awareness, and I'm excited to keep following them as they mature. I think that the thing that I believe that I'm not seeing in these products to date is that the information is not in context. You need to go to a different tool to find information. And I think it'd be a lot better if that information about your data lived in your text editor or in your query tool. I think that will happen. I'm excited to keep watching this space. Communication, well, it's no surprise. This takes place over Slack and email today. In the future, I think we'll have dedicated mediums to discuss data in context. This is going to come in, I think, two forms. One is for pushing out information to consumers about things like changing changes to data or definitions, incidents or downtime. In this feed, consumers will be able to, to subscribe to the information that is relevant to them. Another medium I think we can expect is that you and your peers will be able to have conversations about data in context. Instead of sharing a link to a report or pasting a screenshot of a table and adding your narrative, I think it'd be so much better if we could discuss the data in the context of how you got to that point that you think is so interesting, whatever it might be. What are we missing? Well, communication is fragmented. It takes place in a lot of different channels, and it's hard to know if it's a question about data or marketing or data or product. I think we're going to see unified channels that are augmented with context about data. I also think that we're going to start seeing more communication in line where data is accessed so that data consumers can better understand the health of the data as they query it. Observability. This one's a bit of an open question. In the future, I think we're going to see Datadog for data. Data, data, Datadog. Yeah. Tools like this are going to help us understand what's happening in the warehouse. Did one query fail, or is every query failing? Are query times increasing or decreasing? Are they failing for one user or every user? The way that I want to motivate the need for this part of the stack is by asking you the, uh, a question. Suppose the head of marketing emails you and says, hey, the marketing dashboard looks like a little bit funny. Is everything OK with the data? How do you go about, uh, how do you go about answering that question? What's the first thing you do? What's the second thing you do? What are the threads that you pull on to unravel if everything's OK or not? Wouldn't it be better if our systems told us what was happening and we didn't have to guess and check? Observability is all about removing guesswork from debugging. It's about not needing intuition to pinpoint problems and determine their impacts across what is ultimately a complicated and deeply connected stack. That without this layer, we'll continue to face challenges around opaque and isolated dependencies in our data stacks. Data consumers will continue to be uncertain if the data that they're using to make decisions is actually any good. Here's my ask for you on observability. If there's an engineer on your team that uses a tool like Datadog or a similar, I encourage you to talk to them, get a tour, look at what traces can do for applications, and think about what that might look like in an analytics capacity and how it could help you create stability in your data stack. And so this is the part where I'm going to get to un un unveil my art, if you will. And as a supremely unartistic person, my medium of choice is effectively graph theory. This is a DAG. I'm sure a lot of you have seen DAGs before. And in a lot of ways, it looks like a typical DAG. But there's something really interesting about this DAG. And it's the node all the way at the right. This fire engine red DAG is called an exposure. If you haven't heard about exposures before, might be because they're brand new, but we're really excited about them. An exposure represents a dependency between an external tool, like a, a dashboarding tool or a reporting tool or some sort of operational tool, represents the dependency between that tool and one or more DBT models. And with the introduction of exposures into the DBT DAG, we can now unite the entire data stack, from data sources on the left all the way through to the places where that data is ultimately consumed or operationalized. So we're really excited about exposures. And one of the things we're most excited about is that it allows us to infer things about the operational and analytical, analytical use cases for data. And so, oh no, 
What was that? Sorry. <laughs> Give me one moment. Okay. Gosh, that never would have happened to Steve Jobs. Okay, we're, we're back on track, I think. So I want to unveil to you one of the uh, stellar and incredible new use cases for exposures that is now available in a beta in DBT Cloud. Actually, not in DBT Cloud. It's in your dashboard. I want you to say hello to the dashboard status tile. Uh, this tile reports on the health of all the data sources and models that power a dashboard. It distills this, this status health information into a single green check mark or a red X. This serves to unify information about data health across the entire stack. And crucially, it places that information in context where people are accessing the data. It's a powerful new tile. It changes the relationship between data builders and data consumers. Here, we actually empower data consumers to understand the health of the data and to become involved in the process and to care about investing in making that data high quality and reliable. This, this tile, this data uh, dashboard status tile is powered by a brand new metadata API in DBT Cloud. This API collects, indexes, and serves up information about all of the models, tests, and sources that are run and tested inside of DBT Cloud. We're currently accepting beta testers for these new tiles, as well as the DBT Cloud Metadata API. So if you're interested in giving these a spin and sharing your feedback with us, uh, we'd certainly love to, to get you set up. You can talk to Simon in Slack, and, and he'll work with you together. Uh, this tile comes in a couple different flavors. Today, it works in Looker and Mode, and we're working with the Chartio team as well to get those embedded in there too. Ultimately, you can embed this tile anywhere that supports HTML and iframes. So ideally, you can instrument all of your crucial reporting and operational tools with an iframe like this. I'm really excited not just about these tiles, but also about what it represents and what, what might come beyond this you know, very first cut here. And so if you're interested in this topic, I really do encourage you to stick around and hear from Ben from Mode Analytics right after this. I think I'll have more to say on this topic. The other thing that is uh, available in beta today in DBT Cloud is what we're calling an exposures view. And so what we're seeing here is uh, a view of the health of an exposure for our metrics dashboard in Looker. And we can see the description of that exposure. We can see who its owner is and when the, the parent models of that exposure were last built. In this view, we can see all of the data sources and models and their latency, if they're up to date or not, if the model's built, if the tests are passing. And this is a very small step towards creating the version of observability that we're really excited about. The goal here is if someone says, I think the metrics dashboard is looking kind of funny, you can come here and at a glance, understand if the data is up to date, the models are passing, the tests are passing. And if not, you can drill in from there. In conclusion, there's more work to do ahead of us, but we're gonna keep doing what we do really well. We're going to increase points of connectivity between the different tools and the different people that participate in data practices today. And we're going to keep on solving for uncertainty with data. Make sure to tune back in for a panel when metadata becomes data a little bit later today if you want to hear more about these topics. That's all I have for you today. I look forward to catching up in Slack. A uh, quick special thanks to Madeline Albrecht from the Fishdown team who created all the art in this presentation on very short notice. She's the real MVP. Thanks, Madeline. And and thank you all for joining. All of the art, even the historical references, it was Madeline the whole time. Yeah, Madeline is an ancient Egyptian uh, stone carver. Incredible. I'm so glad she's on our team. Drew, thank you so much for dabbling in the world of metadata. And we have a ton of people in the Slack who are volunteering as tribute to test out this metadata API. And we did have one really interesting question, which I think ties back to some of the presentations we had yesterday. Are there plans to report on this metadata, sorry, to use this metadata API to report on things like runtimes and you know, how long it takes to build a model, where the points of failure commonly occur, and sort of those extended use cases as well? Most definitely. The thing I'm so excited about in this API is being able to, to query data, uh, metadata, if you will, longitudinally and understanding things uh, about change over time. So historical status rates, if runtimes are increasing or decreasing, if they're associated with a, a commit, or even I think in the future, we'll be able to detect schema changes and automatically alert. My pie in the sky thing that I want is if you have CI/CD hooked up in DBT Cloud, 
seeing the, the set of all the schema changes that occur between production and the staging branch. I think that'd be really powerful. Yeah, I'm really, really excited for this future.